Okay, once again, we don't have any chimes this morning, so we're going to call the church to order. Um, if, if this happens next week, I'm going to get up here and go ding, ding, but I'm not going to do that this time. Um, I need to practice anyway. Uh, let's bow our heads together and go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, thank you for gathering us together again in this place. Uh, from wherever we are worshiping this morning, whether it's physically here in this place or uh, with us on the radio or online, uh, we thank you that your people have come together to worship and praise you and to lift up our prayers together and to hear from your word. Lord, we ask that you would bless this time and bless us as we go forth from this worship service uh, out into the world beyond it, that we might be your hands and feet and be used by you in mighty ways. We pray these things in your holy name. Amen. <laughs> Please turn with me with your, in your hymnals to our first hymn, 62, All Creatures of Our God and King. Let's stand together as you're able and we'll sing one, four, and five.
you please remain standing for our affirmation? And that affirmation is found in your hymnal number 889. Today we are doing the affirmation from 1 Timothy number 889. There is one God and there is one mediator, Christ Jesus, who came as a ransom for all, to whom we testify. This saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, and was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed in throughout the world, taken up in glory. Great indeed is the mystery of the gospel. Amen. seated as we welcome our children for the children's message. Someone moved my microphone. Couldn't find it. Sawyer, are you following me? I'm so glad to see you all here today. We have some friends with us. Stone and Izzy, Sam and Swayze are here. Did you just leave Sydney? You're, you're done with Sydney? You don't need, oh, Sam says we don't need her. Okay, well, spoken like a true brother. I get it. School is almost out. Oh, finally. I know. After next week, it's only three more days, and we're out for summer. And actually, those three days, it's two and a half days. We, we've got to count. We're, we're going to make sure we get every, every little bit, and we don't need that other half of a day. I'm so excited. How about you? Yes, you're excited? S Sawyer likes school, but I think she's excited to be out of school for a little while, too. Well, I hope that we all have a fun summer, and I hope that this week goes by quickly. In the next two and a half days as well. Well, I have a question. Have you ever been to the zoo? Yes. Absolutely. Um, have you seen animals with four legs there? Yes lots, yes, lots of animals with four legs. What about animals that walk around on two legs? No. Yeah, yes, absolutely. We've seen, I mean, monkeys usually, well, uh, peacocks, they've got two. You didn't see any at the zoo? There's one that roams free and it'll chase you. I think I've heard a story of um, Girl Scouts camping one time at the zoo and it attacking a tent. That that happened a while back. Um, what about animals with no legs? Or creatures with no legs? Snakes? A legless lizard. A lizard without any legs. That sounds even more terrifying than a lizard with legs. Thank you, Stone, for a new fear. A new fear. Well, um, today I want to tell you about Peter. You, you remember Peter. Peter's the, the guy, the disciple, who denied Christ three times um, before the next day, but was forgiven afterwards. We remember that, right? Well, in the book of Acts, Peter worked really, really hard for the early church, and people were not very happy with Peter, and they were kind of treating him badly because they thought he was hanging out with the wrong kind of people. Um, back then, they had rules for everything, what you wore, what you ate, um, who you talked to, places you could go. They, they had a rule for every little thing. Now, we have rules, right? Yeah, but not that specific. Oh, wait, Sam says a lot of rules. 
He looks pretty serious about that. Well, some of these leaders approached Peter and they thought that he was doing wrong for talking to the people who were not following those rules. But Peter told them something that had happened to him. He had been praying on the roof and he saw a vision. And in it, many kinds of animals were coming down and a voice told Peter to go ahead and eat them. And those were the animals that Peter knew that the Jewish people were told not to eat. So he was a little confused, thought it was a little strange. So he kept praying, but it happened again, the same thing. And then for the third time, Peter's kind of got a, a thing with things happening three times, right? Peter had some visitors who wanted to know more about Jesus. And then Peter realized that God wanted them to know the good news of the gospel, and that the, that good news for the gospel is for everyone, and not just the people that dressed like them or talked like them or ate like them. It was for the people who dressed differently, who talked differently, who hung out with different people, that ate different things. He didn't care that he knew that love, God's love and his grace needed to be shared with everyone. Now, we're all dressed a little different here today, all in our Sunday best, even if we didn't want to put it on. We, we've got to wear it just for church. But we have friends that maybe don't go to church. Or at school, they may wear things a little different than us. Or people in town that we see, they may talk differently than us. They may act differently than us. They may follow the rules, and some of them may not. But believe it or not, God loves them as much as he loves us. And the good news of God's love is not just for people that are here at church. It's for everybody in the whole world. So this week, let it be a reminder that it doesn't matter if the person looks like you or not. It doesn't matter if they're a rule follower or not. Although we do like rule followers, right? It doesn't matter what they eat for dinner or for lunch. What matters is that everyone needs to hear about the love that Jesus has to offer. You think you can do that? Offer that love to everyone, no matter what they're like. Let's pray. God of love, thank you for showing us love throughout the stories in the Bible. Thank you for showing us love. Give us the opportunity to share the love that you have for others. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. All right. You know, there's that, that saying, preaching to the choir. Sometimes, sometimes it feels like that. It's good to see you all today, even if I can't hear you. Um, welcome to First United Methodist Church on this, the fifth Sunday of the Easter season. And yes, we are still in the Easter season, folks. We will be in the Easter season until Pentecost. And so, yeah, all the baskets and eggs have been put away, right? And maybe you're still finding some. Maybe not. I don't know. But it is still the Easter season. We have a few announcements here uh, this morning. The altar flowers that uh, are given today to the glory of God and in honor of Tom Graham. And the flowers were provided by Marie Graham. And so we are grateful for those beautiful flowers adorning our, our, altar, our altar today. Um, and they are lovely. If you uh, would like to adorn the altar with some flowers in honor or memory of someone or for some special occasion, you may uh, contact the church office during regular normal business hours and uh, put your name on the calendar or get your name put on the calendar to, um, to provide flowers if there's a slot available. Um, we don't have written down what our next available is, but I'm sure you can find out if you call the office. Our We Care ministry is continuing to send out prayer cards to people on our prayer list. Uh, when you turn in a prayer request, please include the person's address so we can send them a card. Um, and if you 
don't let that stop you from giving a prayer request. Because if you'll put a prayer request down, we will track you down and get the address later. But if you have it, go ahead and give it to us so we can go ahead and be um, sending, or we can have our ministry folks go ahead and send those out. Um, our offerings, of course, uh, tithes and offerings can be given during the church service. We'll have our ushers um, come forward at the appropriate time for that. But you can also still continue to give online at fumccolumbia.org. Please note, though, when, when paying through PayPal, there is a 2% fee. Don't let that stop you, um, but that uh, needs, to, needs to be noted. Um, we have a couple of other announcements. The Wednesday night supper this Wednesday will be uh, chicken spaghetti. Please, uh, if you plan to come, if you know you're coming and you know how many are in your group, party, family, or whatever, put that on the um, form that you have in front of you if you're here present with us today and put it in the offering plate and you'll be counted um, if you're not with us today or don't have a, a way to fill out the form or you don't want to, um, but you still want to come, we need to know in the church office before noon on Monday, that's tomorrow. By noon tomorrow, we should have a complete list of who's coming on Wednesday for supper. It helps to plan. Um, and so please, if you plan to come, get it to the office by noon tomorrow. Shut-in meals. We are still in need of we are in need of sponsors to provide at Wednesday night supper to our shut-ins. If you or your committee or Sunday school or whatever group of the church would be interested in sponsoring a meal at the seven dollar a plate fee, please contact the office. If you are aware of someone from the congregation that would benefit, please send their name to Linda Struck or to the office. If you would like to pay at Wednesday supper, please let Linda know, and she will mark down your meal to be delivered the following week. So we'll, we'll keep track of it. Linda, Linda will, will be on top of it. Um, so if you want to be a part of that, please let us know. Uh, Vacation Bible School is coming up. It is fast approaching. We've had our last WWW Children's Program for the year, and uh, it's, it's sad. But we've got Vacation Bible School coming up, and we need to be ready. So please help. Volunteers are needed for Vacation Bible School, June 5th through the 8th, from 5.30 to 7.30. We are in need of 20 to 30 volunteers and currently have had, uh, I think there's a little bit more since this was written, but as of the time this was written, it said four, signed up, um, four volunteers signed up. If you can help in any capacity, please contact the office or Kelly Oglesby, uh, any help will be greatly appreciated. Please, well, this is the time when the church when the church says, and as I said this before, I'll say it again. If the church says we want to offer a vacation Bible school, if we want to have a vital uh, ministry during the summer, uh, then the church has to step up. You can't just say it and wash your hands of it. You need to be willing to. I think I said this on Wednesday: walk the walk, not just talk the talk. So please, you don't even have to be all that talented. Just show up. We'll find a place for you. But we need volunteers. Also in your bulletin is the upcoming schedule for the week, uh, XYZ at 9 o'clock on Wednesday, supper at 5.15, Bible study at 5.45. Um, and then... We have this, I'm not going to read the whole flyer, but this came into the church office um, for, um, we've been praying for uh, Riley Turnage, um, who had been diagnosed with a rare form of brain cancer. Um, there's a committee that are uh, gathering, um, getting churches to gather a love offering. They, they call it the, the loaves and fishes offering for her and her family. So, uh Please, this, we're not asking for you to give today. This is just to let you know that we will be doing some sort of second collection on May 29th. I know we've got a lot going on May 29th, but this is when the committee was asking everyone to do this. So you've got a couple of weeks. But please make uh, sure that you're ready to give on May 29th to that second collection. 
that will go to this loaves and fishes offering for Riley Turnage. Um, you can make your checks payable to FUMC with Turnage in the memo line to make sure that that goes to the right place. And that's coming up, and we'll announce it again next Sunday uh, as well. But that's coming up. So please put that on your calendar, get that on your to-do list, and be ready to give. With no other announcements, I'm going to go on to our pastoral prayer. If you would please bow your heads with me. Almighty God, as always, we, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity to come together and to worship you. As some of us uh, were discussing in, in Sunday school this morning, it is a great privilege that we have that we can come here with very little fear of worshiping you and publicly declaring our belief in you. There are places in the world, oh God, we know where where to say the name Jesus out loud in the wrong place at the wrong time could be life-changing and not in a good way. We know that there are Christians in the world who just for uttering the name Jesus can be dragged off to prison, can be executed, can have their lives completely turned upside down in an instant. What a great privilege we have to be here in this place to lift your name up, not only here, but on the radio and online. And when we leave this place, we can happily declare that we have just come from church and we've just said, praise the Lord. We can do that. And I know that there are times when that can be scary. There are situations where, where things go wrong, where, where people make bad choices, but Lord... Ultimately, here, we enjoy the freedom to worship as we see fit. Let us never take that for granted. Let us never become complacent in our worship. But always remember that this is a great privilege and also a responsibility to, to proclaim the name of Jesus wherever we go. So let every person within our sphere of influence, O oh God, know that we follow you. And Lord, maybe help others come to a realization that they need to follow after you, Lord Jesus, as well. Make us bold to proclaim your name. Help us to be your hands and feet in the world. We ask that you would uh, show us your glory, that we would see your healing touch come upon all of these that we lift up on our prayer list today and that we name in our heart. Lord, we look for healing and wholeness for all of these situations. We look for peace, again, in places where there has been no peace and hope where there's only been despair and fear. Lord, and if we can be used by you in even just a tiny way to answer prayer, to, to offer a, a listening ear, or to be a calming presence, to offer a, a help in times of need in your name, Help us to do that, oh God. Help us to live as kingdom people, as Easter people, whose reality is the, is the cross and the empty tomb. We pray all of these things in your name, and we come together now, and we pray together the prayer that you taught us so long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
Stand with me again as we sing our offertory hymn, Lead On, O King Eternal, 580. Let's stand together. We'll sing one and three. Let's bow our heads for our offertory prayer. Almighty God, we ask that you would bless Dow the giving back of these, your tithes and our offerings, that they might be used to glorify your name and to further your kingdom in this place. For it is in that holy name that we pray. Amen.
Thank you. You may be seated. Our scripture reading for today comes to us from the book of Acts in the 11th chapter. We're looking at Acts verses 11 verses 1 through 18 today. Acts 11, 1 through 18. Now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain it to them step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. 
There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners. And it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, By no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time the voice answered from heaven, What God has made clean you must not call profane. This happened three times, then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God. When they heard this, they were silenced, and they praised God, saying, Then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. And that's where we'll stop for today. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please bow your heads and pray with me once again. Lord, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be found acceptable before you, our rock and our redeemer. In the name of Jesus, who is the risen Christ, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. There was once a man who staggered into church one day. He was unkempt and disheveled, and he was rushing in, not quite at the last minute, but very nearly. As he came through the door, there were people around, but no one approached him. So he took a seat down front. A few minutes later, a tap on his shoulder caused him to turn around, and an usher spoke to him. Sir, if you would please come with me, we have some seats in the back. Today is a special day, and these seats are on camera. And you know, you understand. Not another word was spoken between them as the stranger moved to the back of the service, and the service began. Moved to the back of the church, and then the service began. It got to be the middle of the service and time for the sermon, and two people got up from the congregation who were leaders in the church. We apologize, folks, for at this time we were going to introduce our new pastor and have him preach his first sermon here, but somehow he must have been delayed and he hasn't come. And at that moment, the stranger got up from the back and started to move forward, and he said, Oh, yes, he is here. He went up to the pulpit, and he began to speak. He introduced himself and apologized for being late, but he had some car trouble down the road, which he had attempted to rectify unsuccessfully. And so he then attempted to walk to the church, and through a series of mishaps along the road had come to this disheveled state in which he was in. He said, but I walked into the church here and no one greeted me. No one even asked about my condition. They ignored me, so I took a seat. And then finally, someone came up to me, but only to ask me to move away from the camera's viewpoint. I know I could have said something at any time, but that, by that point, I wanted to see more from the back. When I sat down, 
the families on either side of me and in front of me moved away. No one offered me any service or directions or help of any kind. You had many opportunities to extend the hand of Christ, but you didn't. And I learned more about the character of this church by the way you made me feel unwelcome than I ever could have learned in any reception or committee meeting or by any other means. Who are you that you attempt to thwart the plans of God? This passage of Scripture is a, is a strange one, I'll give you that, but it's one that is necessary to the growth of the church. The question I would ask you, and I'm going to ask you, I could ask this at the end, but I'm going to ask it at this point so that you can be thinking about it, is are there any who would assume, this is a question for you to ask yourself, are there any persons who would assume automatically that my church is not for them. Does this give me a check in my spirit? And if, if it does not, then where are my growing edges? What do we need to give over to God to come to a place where all are not only welcome in the church, not only welcome by, by saying it out loud, but by those who are made to feel welcome in the church. For here is the, the main point of the whole sermon. This is not your church or my church. This is Christ's church. Are there any that would not be allowed in? And I say this because this passage of Scripture was one that showed the early church that they needed to sort of change or tweak their way of thinking when it came to followers of Christ. There had been many different viewpoints, many laws, many, as as our our children's minister said, lots of rules to follow in in Jesus' day. The people of God uh, had rules for going places or not going places, rules for how they dressed, certainly what they could eat or not eat. And it hindered their religious growth. It excluded lots of people, especially when it came to being a follower of the way, or as they would later be known as Christians, for being a Christian. And there was this idea that those who could be Christians, who could follow after Christ, were only those who had first been uh, Jewish believers. So in the scripture, when it talks about those who were the circumcised believers, those were those who had been of the Jewish faith, like Peter, who had, who had become Christians, but had first been Jews. And there was a debate in the early church about whether or not that was necessary. Does someone have to become Jewish first before they can become a Christian, a follower of Jesus? And so here we have Peter who is is praying. And he's, uh, well, first of all, this, this passage is a retelling of what happened in the previous chapter. And the reason it's so important that it become a a retelling that Peter explains himself is because this is framed by those who were the, as as we said, the the circumcised believers who couldn't believe, couldn't understand why Peter would uh, lower himself to a, a state where he would eat with those who were not circumcised, who, who were not following kosher laws, who, who were not quote-unquote believers before they became believers. The Gentiles, those who were not of the Jewish faith but had come to a belief in Christ. So Peter tells them this wonderful story and, and the, the full story, it's longer in chapter 10, Peter sums it up in chapter 11, but the story is that he goes to, um, 
Well, already he's in Joppa. And if you're following along in the story of Acts, he's there because the believers there had asked him to come because a, a disciple there, uh, Tabitha, or also named Dorcas, had died. And he goes there to raise her from the dead. And so he stays in Joppa for a little while, and he's stay, staying at the house of Simon the Tanner. And while he's there, in the course of the time that he's there, this happens. And I mentioned on Wednesday that there are times in the Bible where, where God uses prayer in, in a way to bring people together. It, one person is praying in one place, and what happens is complemented by something that someone is praying in another place. And I don't think I said it very well on Wednesday in Bible study. But here we have a situation where we have someone who is a believer. He's, he's a Roman citizen. He's a Gentile, and he believes in God. He's come to a place where he believes in God, but he's not a Christian yet. But he is believing in God and trying to li live a decent life. He's a Roman centurion, a soldier, a military man, and he's in Joppa. I mean, he's in Caesarea Maritima, which is the Roman uh, capital, port capital of the of that time. Lots of people come in and out of that place. Lots of Romans. Lots of entertainment. Lots of. I mean, there's all kinds of things going on in Caesarea Maritima. But he was a good man, a believer in God, even though he didn't quite understand everything about God. But he was praying. And at that time, he got a vision from God, a word that said, send to Joppa for a man by the name of Simon, who goes by Peter, at the house of Simon the Tanner, and have him brought to you. He has a message for you. And so he sends his people. He sends two servants and a trusted soldier. And then when they get close to the city, Peter is also praying, and he has this vision. And this is a wonderful vision, and I want to say this at the outset, that this is not about food. It, it looks like it's about food, but it's not. In chapter 10, it says that Peter was very hungry, but it also said that he was waiting for the food to be prepared. He had a meal coming, but while he was praying in his hunger, God used that, and he showed him a vision. And the vision was that the sheet came down from the heavens, held by its four corners, representing the four corners of the earth, even though the earth is round, but you know what I mean. And on it were all kinds of animals. Some were clean animals. Many of them were not by the Jewish standards of, of, of dietary laws. And he hears a voice that says, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter says, Peter says, Surely not, or by no means. And what he really said there was, You've got to be kidding me. That's, that's the language that is used, but that's, that's, that, doesn't, that phrase doesn't appear in the Bible. But really, that's what, what Peter was saying. You've got to be kidding me. I've spent my whole life following these dietary laws. Nothing profane has ever gone across my lips at all. He betrayed Jesus three times, but he hadn't eaten anything bad at all. But then the voice tells him, what God has proclaimed clean, do not call profane. What God has made clean. And this happens, this vision happens not once, not twice, but three times. And then, as he's, as he's having this vision, the men that were sent from Caesarea show up at Simon's house. And they go on to Caesarea after Peter has hosted them in Simon's house for a day. So the meal that he was expecting, he got to eat, and he ate with these strangers. I want to point this out, too. He's in the house of Simon the Tanner. Now, Simon, his profession was to be a tanner, which is somebody who dealt with animal skins, 
those that had 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 were had been killed and the skins were used to to make clothing and things he was somebody who 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 worked with all of those kind of things so already peter is staying with someone whose house by very definition of their their laws about animals and 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 blood and such would have already been somewhat unclean Peter has it all around him as he's staying with Simon the Tanner. But somehow he he works through that, but then he has this vision and he welcomes these people in and then they go to Caesarea and they meet with Cornelius. And Peter preaches the gospel to them. And they were already people of of faith in God, but he added the, the part about Jesus Christ and talked to them about what it all meant for them, and the whole household is baptized. The very first non-Jewish family to be baptized into the faith, recorded in, in history, baptized into the faith. Because Peter was able to get over himself. You know, we, we have a tendency to think of biblical figures as sort of larger than life, right? When we do that, we, we separate ourselves from James and John and Peter and Moses and Elijah, and we, we turn the Bible into a book of fantastic tales that are really too extraordinary to believe. We mustn't forget that the Bible altogether is a book about ultimately God's love for humanity and God's redemptive story. And so the people contained within its pages are not superheroes. They're not extraordinary people. They are flawed. They are uh, messy. They make mistakes. They're just like you and me. God didn't make mistakes But we as a people, as a human race, had fallen and turned away and we brought into the world sin and chaos and physical death. And because of God's love, he allowed us to to make the choice. We chose poorly. And that's why he sent Jesus to die on the cross to save us from our sins, to save us from ourselves. but we are flawed. And that's what this passage is about. Peter is trying to do the best he can. He, he's a little taken aback when, when the voice tells him to do something that he considers to be profane and wrong, what he'd been taught all of his life to not do. And the voice tells him to do it, but the point is not about the food, but to realize that when God has called something clean it's not our place it wasn't his place to then turn around and call it garbage or bad or unclean who am i peter says this at the end of the passage he says once he once he preached the gospel message to them He saw the gift of the Holy Spirit descend upon the household. And in that moment, he realized that the people of Cornelius' household were not that different from himself. That if they could receive the same gift that had come upon him and the other disciples and apostles at Pentecost, the gift of the Holy Spirit that was given by God to to them in that special time was also given to Cornelius and his household who had not spent their lives eating certain foods or dressing a certain way. Then that gift was for everyone. God had chosen to pour that out upon them, and he and who was he to make that distinction? He even says to his fellow disciples, if then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I 
that I could hinder God. And that, that's not just the word, the word there is not just hinder. It is also translated in some places as thwart, oppose, forbid, withstand, stop, interfere, or to stand in God's way which were all valid translations and things that Peter would have tried to do had he not understood the gift was for all. And the amazing thing about this passage, the best part about it of all, is that once Peter tells his story, then the disciples get excited about it too. The disciples in Jerusalem begin to understand, and they are changed by what Peter experienced. They are changed by the prayer that Peter has given and by the gospel message that he has spread to Cornelius and Cornelius' house. So not only is that family in Caesarea altered for the better, but all of Christian history changed. My brothers and sisters, we, we often credit Paul with spreading the gospel message to the Gentiles, which he did. But it was Peter who first baptized a Gentile family. That's a legacy that we belong to, that you and I, here in this place, we are Christians we follow the way. And nobody has said to us, we have to first become this or become that before we can do it. Because God's message of salvation is for all. All who will believe. All who will recognize, I too am a sinner in need of a Savior. What a wonderful message to receive. And Peter was changed, yes. And the church was changed, yes. But you and I are changed as well. Who are we to, to tell someone they cannot come in to this house of worship? Who are we to say, who can praise God with us? I, I, I'm the story that I told you before is is a story that uh, uh, I, I I wrote down before church, but it's based on stories that I've heard. Unfortunately, it happens. If somebody comes into the church and they don't look right, they don't look like everybody else, or they're disheveled and unkempt, and they they look dirty and gross then we dismiss them as someone unworthy of our attention. And that is not how God feels about them. Every person who walks across the threshold of this church or comes in contact with each and every one of us on a day-to-day -day basis is someone who was created in the image of God, just like you and me. So, when we treat someone as lower or other or unworthy, we are turning our backs on God and saying, we know better. We know better. But God, God wants us to love everyone. God wants us to understand that what He has made clean cannot be, cannot be proclaimed profane by any human individual or agency. God is love, and He wants to, us to reflect that love to all. So this passage of Scripture is, is not about food. It's about how we treat others, what it means to really be a Christian and to extend Christian love and hospitality. Because it's important to Him how we act, 
what we do and say to others. Because in the moment that we act or don't act can be life-changing, life-altering for someone else. And we are meant to be known as Christians by our love. Amen. Our closing hymn today is Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Let's stand together. 384, we'll sing one, three, and four. My brothers and sisters, go forth now in peace to love and to serve the Lord always. Amen.